Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're talking with Dr. Michael Anderson, Senior Advisor at the HHS Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response in Washington, D.C., about what physicians need to know about monoclonal antibody treatments for COVID-19. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Anderson, thanks so much for being here today. Um, while the number of COVID cases in this country continues to decrease, Monoclonal antibody treatments have become the standard of care for certain stages of the disease. Can you explain first the science of these treatments? Sure, Todd, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, up until November of 2020, um, physicians were faced with a terrible dilemma. A patient had turned positive for novel SARS-CoV-2, but wasn't sick enough to be hospitalized. And all we had was really hope and prayer. Now we have three, repeat, three EUA-approved monoclonal antibodies that have shown to be effective in this particular group of patients. They're symptomatic. They've turned positive for novel SARS-CoV-2, but thank goodness they are not sick enough to be admitted. And the EUA criteria for exactly who those patients are has changed. We'll talk about that in just a minute. The science is pretty straightforward. These are exogenous antibodies. Um, aimed at novel SARS-CoV-2, they bind the spike protein, and they basically are an interim step until the patient can recover, generate their own antibodies, and of course, vaccine has really been life-saving. So they bind to the spike protein, that then destroys uh, the virus and provides, I think of it sort of as a bridge, a bridge until the patient's own immune system can kick in, hopefully via vaccine, and then the patient is then recovered. When you think about the window for treatment, when is you know, use of this treatment most effective and, uh, and which patients tend to benefit the most? Yeah, if you take one thing away from our time today, no earlier is better. That The EUA says within 10 days of symptoms, but we've seen in studies coming in over the past several months, the earlier the better. Now the EUA criteria has changed. This is sort of breaking news with monoclonal antibodies. I and mean, when we sit here in June of 2021, a lot of things have changed as well. But there are certain high-risk patients that really need to get these therapies as soon as possible. The elderly, patients with pre-existing conditions. And recently, the FDA changed and added a couple of things. Number one, the definition of obesity went down to a BMI of 25. Number two, they added pregnant women to the high-risk category. So pregnant women now qualify for these therapies. And the last line is specifically, or I should say really important for clinicians. And that is the FDA says, you as a clinician, you as the physician taking care of this patient, think that the benefits outweigh the risks. That to me says two things. Number one, it really gives you know, clinical judgment back to the clinicians. And number two, it says these are really becoming part of the fabric of everyday medicine. And you doctors, you tell us if you think this patient can benefit from these therapies. You know, when we were back in the kind of the height of the pandemic, a lot of the, there were a lot of obstacles, let's just say, toward getting to what you said, which is like early, kind of early intervention here. Do you think some of those challenges of, you know, we've been able to move past them? I, I believe that's true. We've administered over 500,000 doses uh, of these monoclonals. So somehow we're getting across the barriers. And my assessment of the barriers to getting these therapies in are really in two buckets. One is there has been some clinical resistance. Are these drugs really effective? The data is so preliminary. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of harking back to the classic thinking that it takes almost a decade from a new medication to when it's standard of care. And we've been trying to do this in a matter of nine months. But as you see the data come in, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. The data is overwhelming that in this high risk group of patients that is not sick enough to be admitted yet, there is a 70%, repeat 70% decrease in the need for hospitalization in those patients. So I think that the, the clinical resistance is really much less so. The second is operational. This is very easy to say. You should administer monoclonal antibodies to high-risk patients. But there's some operational barriers behind that, right? This is currently an IV infusion, although there is a new subcutaneous route available. You have to infuse it over a half an hour, so that means you gotta get an IV in. You have to have an area to infuse, and you have to monitor the patients for an hour afterwards. I gotta tell you though, I have seen, and I've actually deployed with a couple of these teams, this country has really been innovative on how we bring these therapies to patients. We've seen in-home infusions, we've seen mobile vans, 
we've seen sort of SWAT teams go to nursing homes when there's been outbreaks. And of course, hospitals and FQHCs are the backbone of this country. Um, so I think that these barriers remain because we're still not getting the highest percentage possible of, of, of potential patients. But boy, I gotta tell you, I'm so encouraged by how the country has really risen to this challenge. Well, that is really great news because I do recall in those kind of early days that those kind of operational practical considerations were such a challenge, but I'm really encouraged by the numbers that you started to talk about in terms of the benefits. Can you talk a little bit more about the benefits that we're seeing with uh, monoclonal antibody treatment? Yeah, slowly but surely these therapeutic trials are coming in. And like I said, it's breaking news. Every week there's something new, whether it's a new EUA criteria. Um, actually, as we sit here in June, um, there's a press release from the Regeneron Corporation of a potential inpatient uh, application. More to come on that in, in the future coming weeks. But the data is consistent in the stuff that we've seen, 70 to 80% decrease in the need for hospitalization. And that does a couple of important things. For that one patient in front of the doctor, boy, that's terrific, right? That means that patient's risk of dying, that patient's risk of, of mortality or being admitted is decreased by a, an incredible percentage. The other thing that really um, speaks to me as a, as a former hospital administrator, um, it's ICU and hospital capacity. That means that less patients are, are flooding the emergency departments, less patients are taking up valuable resources. And then finally, if you think about it, um, and the, the data is still early and this is more conjecture, there's decreased spread. If we can stop this viral load in a particular patient, then hopefully we have less spread within family. So the benefits are, are really incredible. Yeah, that's like somebody, you know, coming home with the flu and your family. Uh, and that, that exactly. can be scary for everybody else. Exactly. Um, you know, I'm hearing a lot, of course, and talking a lot to folks about these different variants. The latest one that we're talking a lot about is the Delta variant. Are we yep. seeing, you know, these treatments effective for variants? Yeah, the, the variants do cause us concern. The fact that you know our, we're not really to herd immunity yet and there's still pockets across this nation um, that have not achieved a high vaccination rate, that's concerning to those individual patients and to those regions. The second is that then gives the virus a chance to replicate and, and generate you know, these variants. That's very, very concerning. Um, I find comfort in the knowledge that on a real-time basis, and I'm talking about weekly, the FDA and the CDC and state health officials are making sure that the drug companies that produce this are testing these variants against, um, I'm sorry, are testing these medications against these variants. Um, right now, uh, the FDA, CDC, and HHS are working in real time to make sure um, we're not gonna be shipping product to a state if a variant of concern is not sensitive to that product. And you'll see there's now nine, nine states where the USG, United States government, is not um, pushing the Lilly product to the states for use. So, this, the, the variants are of concern. Um, the government is monitoring it closely. And if, if a particular region or state hits a percentage of a variant that is not sensitive to this drug, then we're not going to be shipping that medication. So bottom line up front is, yeah, the variants are of concern. Um, the two products that are uh, procured by the United States government, Lilly and Regeneron, and now there's a third monoclonal antibody by AstraZeneca, we're testing those on a real-time basis. So, uh, you know, several months ago when I talked to my physician to prepare, uh, you know, about getting access, should I need this? She was, you know, very, very proactive in saying, you know, let's get that test fast. I will track this down for you. Still in that process of a lot of, you know, practical obstacles. Now that we are where we are, you know, what do you see as the physician's primary role in increasing access uh, to use of these treatments and, and particularly in underserved areas? Yeah, it's really important. First and foremost, that physician has the relationship with the patient. And I think patients, I know patients have a lot of questions. This is new. I don't completely understand what a monoclonal is. Is this safe? And the tragic stories I've seen or we've heard of are patients don't feel that bad. Like it's day two of symptoms and they have a little cough, maybe a fever. I don't know if I need this experimental therapy. Uh, I, I'm feeling pretty well. The physicians have to take the rallying cry of, but we know the sooner you get these therapies, that's going to prevent you from getting worse and going down to what can be a terrible, terrible path of this disease. So the first, I believe, role for physicians is continue to talk to your patients. They trust you. You have that relationship. Talk to the patients about these therapies. The second is more the advocacy gene that I think physicians do so well. That is, if you see your region, whether it's your local hospital, your health officials, your particular clinics, aren't really offering or embracing monoclonals, 
figure out why. You know, the data is showing these are a very effective therapy at preventing the progression of disease. Be an advocate for, for your particular group of patients. Say, well, where are these therapies available? And if, you're, if you don't have them, let's, let's figure out how we can get them because it's, it is an infusion, but it's still really pretty straightforward. Well, that's a, that's a good, I love your point, basically. I think uh, sometimes people are just tempted to say, I'm going to shake it off and kind of ride this out. But the downside of that could be incredible. And this physician as an advocate is really, really important. You know, how can physicians find out uh, where to access this treatment locally? Really three ways. Um, combat got combatcovid.hhs.gov is our website. We've got resources that regionally show you're in Cleveland, Ohio. These are the institutions that are infusing. So it's easy that way. The second is I think the great majority of physicians across this country do have some relationship, either employment or medical staff privileges. Reach out to your local hospital. Are you offering this and, and what else can we do? And then I also think there's very innovative ways. I've had the honor of working with federally qualified health centers and urgent care centers and infusion centers um, that have really taken this on as a part of, of the fabric of what they're offering to patients. Vaccine is really important and we can't you know, diminish how important vaccine is and who knows what boosters are going to mean in the coming year. But I think there's great um, potential for innovation in physicians offering this in their practice. We've also in the federal government, I'm a contractor for the federal government, so I don't speak on behalf of the USG, but we've seen really innovative ways where um, reimbursement has been increased for giving these therapies so that we say to innovative clinics, FQHCs, what have you, you know, we also understand there's a reimbursement ele element to this. And I think CMS has been really responsive. Excellent. Um, you mentioned earlier that some physicians are, you know, skeptical because of the, the EUA status yeah. of this treatment, you know, uh, uh, or the fact that we're still kind of at the early stages of research, uh, or even because of misinformation, of which there yeah. obviously is a ton out there. What, what is your message to those experiencing hesitancy in referring patients? Yeah, I think that the data is becoming overwhelming, and I don't use that word lightly. Um, this consistent 70 to 80 percent decrease in the need for hospitalization in patients is consistent throughout the studies. I do think it points to something that we've been saying within the United States government. I'm sure the AMA and others are saying we've got to assess how to do this better next time. Like, what are the lessons we've learned during this pandemic, and this is just Mike, the physician speaking as a personal opinion, I do think this whole notion of an EUA, how physicians understand the process and how quite frankly, we get data back to the docs in, in a quicker basis. So I'm a physician in Detroit, Michigan. I have had the courage to open up a monoclonal or refer lots of patients. I think we writ large, academic medicine and the government have to get better at getting EUA data into the hands of, of physicians to say, Thank you for the courage to stand up and do this for your patients, but here's the data that this has generated and this is what it's showing as we emerge into this crisis. I think that's to me sort of a pin in something that we have to get better for because there will be more pandemics, right? We have to make sure we're, we're better prepared for the next one. That's a really good point, especially you know when you think about how much we've learned and at the pace at which the learning has occurred over the past years, uh, past year, it's been uh, reasonably intense, let's just say for that. Um, you mentioned that, you know, the, the kind of outline for uh, the types of patients that are best suited to this kind of treatment. Are there any kind of side effects or guidance on vaccination after receiving yeah. uh, this kind of treatment that we need to make uh, physicians aware of? That comes up a lot. The EUA guidance is if you receive the monoclonal antibody, you should not, repeat, not get vaccine for 90 days. And that's sort of, um, I think some patients have said, well, I want to get the vaccine, you know, is this therapy preclude me from getting it? Well, the problem is if, I, if I'm vaccine naive, I haven't seen the vaccine um, and I'm positive for novel SARS-CoV-2, like we got to take care of you now, right? Mm -hmm. We'll get the vaccine, but these antibodies are taking care of you now and fighting the virus with this exogenous antibody. We will get you the vaccine in 90 days, but let's get through this particular uh, hump in the road. There's an interesting second set of patients and those are patients that have been immunized, either one or two doses of the vaccine, and yet they turn positive. And I think we've had more and more clinicians reach out and go, do they qualify for the monoclonals? Well, I'd come back to that new EUA. This is in the judgment of the clinician. But um, once again, Mike's personal opinion, if there's a patient in front of you whom you're worried about, um, who has tested positive, 
obviously the vaccine for whatever reason hasn't fought the virus off. Very, very rare, but it does happen. Um, I, I think monoclonals are a really good potential therapy for that patient. Because once again, we've got sort of a short-term window. We have to get that patient um, through uh, and, and hopefully improve their outcomes. I'm just curious, why, why the 90 days in the earlier, you know, between administering monoclonal antibodies and getting vaccine? I think the thinking is, and once again, this is Mike's teleologic thinking, not based on a lot of science. I think that this is, um, you've already been infected, you're going to mount your own immune response for a while. So this vaccine isn't really going to, to do you a whole lot of good. So let's give you the monoclonal. Let's see what the half-life is, probably 30 days. And then let's wait a little while until you get the vaccine. So that's once again, Mike kind of MacGyvering mm -hmm. together um, the explanation. But I think once again, the bottom line is I am positive for a novel SARS-CoV-2 so I need to get over the hump of this disease and then worry about vaccine a little later. Mm -hmm. I get that. Um, you know, thinking toward the future, you know, is there still going to be a need for monoclonal antibodies uh, down the road once the majority of people are vaccinated? I think you kind of answered that a little bit. What's your view there? Yeah, I think these are important tools for clinicians and it's getting more and more interesting and quite frankly, sometimes a little confusing because there are new products coming down. And I think from my perspective, the great relationships the United States government has built with academic medicine and with terrific societies like AMA um, and with local health officials, those bridges and structures I think are gonna be really important going into the next year because God forbid we do have a dust up of Delta or the unvaccinated population feels significant outbreaks. The data is really, really clear. These therapies help those patients. The second thing is there are novel and interesting medications coming down, including potential oral antivirals. Uh, as I mentioned, sort of breaking news, potential uh, inpatient use of these therapies. So I think these therapies are, are really here for the long term. Uh, I think once again, we've got to take lessons learned from what went well and what didn't go well. Um, but I think that, that physicians have to stay current on what are the particular indications for these therapies how are the variants um, impacting that to your good point? And I think these therapies are gonna be around for a while. Really is kind of just another miracle of the, of the past year in terms of effectiveness. It's to really terrific news. Uh, Dr. Anderson, thank you so much. Uh, I've learned a lot and I hope our audience has too. Uh, appreciate you sharing all this uh, the data information about monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and just to repeat the website uh, one more time for physicians who are watching or listening, it's combatcovid.hhs.gov. Go take a look for more information. We'll be back soon with another COVID-19 update. In the meantime, additional information on the AMA site, ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us today. Please take care.